Good morning, and first of all, congratulations to the Institute of uh, receiving their charter. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit jealous being from the Netherlands. I don't think our royals are that much interested in cyber security. Um, maybe they are, they haven't taught me. I, I'm not aware that we have any, any chartered institutes dealing with uh, security in the Netherlands. Um, but then I guess we are ahead of you in, a, in, in one dimension when it comes to royals. After 80 years, three generations of queens, we have a king. <laughs> so, not sure it's better, but... <laughs> and it's, it's taking some getting used to. Um, but yeah, back to, to cyber security. And I guess the previous speaker already spoke a lot about how the world is changing. Uh, the world is changing very rapidly and the world is change, basically changing for all of us. The future corporation, even the future government, um, it's going to be connected, intelligent, whatever that exactly means, autonomous, but because of that it will also be vulnerable. Um, we will get data from many different data sources. Um, and there is a tendency, even though yes I agree uh, GDPR is forcing us to rethink our data strategy, but there is a, da a tendency to collect data just because we can. I mean, I was in a big debate uh, recently about 5G, and just because 5G gives us this great opportunity to collect more data, have more real-time data, we, we want to do it. I think we have to pause and think about what data do we really need and what's the right data architecture. But the future corporation will be all about data. Data is the new currency. Uh, and it will also be about connection. No, no organization exists in isolation anymore. So if by nature you think, well, my, my industry is not a target for cyber criminals, well, think again. Because you may not be the primary target, but because you are connected and operating in a connected world, you may be a stepping stone. So yes, you will be a target. Every organization is a target because we, are, we live in a connected world. Um, and all those connections make us more vulnerable. We did a lot of research, and I want to share some 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 details from two um, uh, areas of research we did. One is um, basically interviewing C-suite, uh, CEOs, board members about how do, they, how do they perceive cybersecurity. And the second uh, piece of research I'll be quoting from is from um, uh, our research in the cost of cybercrime. And more importantly, how can we reduce the cost of cybercrime? Um, but first of all, when we spoke to our C-suite, I mean, this is backing up the statement I made about the, the, the changing organizations. 86% 86 of, of the respondents basically says, yes, um, we are adopting at least three um, of these new technologies, and digital, mobile, cloud, IoT, and the list goes on, um, are pervasive. IoT, uh, to my surprise, was actually more pervasive than cloud um, in, in many organizations. And I... I feel to this day it's still a bit of a blind spot for many security professionals, certainly for many CISOs, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, and that means basically that our attack surface is just increasing. Now again, I'm talking to security professionals, so that's nothing new to you, but then that really begs the question, if we already struggled to protect a narrow attack surface, how on earth are we going to deal with this, this spreading attack surface? with IoT, with pervasive um, presence everywhere. How are we going to do that? What do we need to do? Um, and to make matters worse, um, things are not getting better at the moment. If you really look, and I guess just opening the newspaper, reading about all the attacks, uh, the, the average number of breaches, so actual breaches, and a breach can be uh, a piece of malware, it can be uh, successful phishing, uh, all the way until a successful penetration and, and uh, capturing of, uh, of data, um, has actually again gone up. When we did our research in 2018, we saw an 11% increase on average with organizations. Now, maybe just to paint the context, this is not just focused, as you see with a lot of uh, research on American uh, companies and not just on uh, global corporates. This is research done over a number of years across 11 countries, uh, including the UK, including the Netherlands, including France, Italy, 
um, etc. So it gives a fairly even view uh, across the globe of what is really happening. Um, now the good news, I didn't put it on this slide, but I feel I owe you some good news as well, um, is that we are also getting better at detecting them. Um, so the percentage of these breaches that we detect is actually going up faster. So we are getting better. Only one third um, stay undetected for, for a long time. So that's, that's the good news. But it means we need to keep increasing um, our efforts. Also because the cost, I, they just keep uh, going up. And these costs um, can be in, 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 in many different categories. It can be just the, the effort of cleaning up things. It can be the cost of having to inform your clients. It can be the indirect cost um, of losing revenues. It can be, uh, well, uh, Maersk was already mentioned, they had to shut down operations for a couple of days. I mean, those are very significant uh, costs. And again, these costs um, keep going up. Uh, and they go up basically in all the countries we, we surveyed, there wasn't a single country where we saw the cost stabilizing uh, or going down. So um, it's a big issue. And it's a big issue for boards. Um, so I get a lot of questions from, from board members, CEOs, and the typical question I, I get is, are we doing enough? And are we doing the right things? Are we ready for what's coming? So they want to get involved. Um, and there's basically four areas that we feel that they should really be talking about. First of all, do we understand what is at stake? Um, I mentioned IoT. In, in many cases, when we talk about security and when we talk about the scope and mandate of a CISO, it's typically only in the, the back of a tr traditional legacy environment, the, uh, the corporate systems. Um, what about these, the plant systems, the, the systems that are basically uh, automating your plant? Um, what about the IoT systems that are out there uh, on, the, on the vehicles or on the vessels that are going all around the world? Do they fall into the scope of the CISO? Do we think of them when we talk about crown jewels? In many cases we don't. So do we really understand what's at stake? Do we also understand the threat? Um, and it's important for boards to really understand that. And it's our job um, to actually help those boards to understand it. Because uh, they don't have the, the insight in threat landscape. They don't have the insight in what's, what's really at stake, where are the real risks. So we need, to, we need to help them. And it means we need to be able um, to translate the risks into a meaningful uh, language to them. That's actually the fourth point, and I'll talk more about that. Then do we put security first? Previous speakers spoke about it as well. I mean, to this day, security is often still an afterthought. Um, we launch a new project, we introduce new technologies, we innovate, we come up with great new business ideas, and only after some time we think about, oh, well, maybe we should have done something about security. We don't start with security in mind. We don't really embed security into our culture. So we still got a lot of work to do. We, as security professionals, but it requires our, 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 our boards, uh, our senior executives, to really get that mindset of putting security first. But again, it's up to us to make sure they understand why. And then one of the big questions that everyone's grappling with, what's the right amount? Now, it's very hard to give one amount. Because the right amount de depends on your risk appetite, it depends on the sector you're in, it depends on are you part of the critical infrastructure, it depends on legislation, etc., etc. So maybe it's more important to ask where do we need to invest? And I want to share some of the results of our, uh, um, our research to show you some areas and to give you some food for thought, hope hopefully, about where should you invest. And then lastly, are we measuring the right things when we talk about cybersecurity? Um, I was at the World Economic Forum last week. They, they, they had their um, annual meeting, what they call it, the Summer Davo, and they do it in China, um, of all places. Um, there was a session uh, which was called um, Cyber Risks, um, uh, What Should Every CEO Know? Something like that. Um, the panel, I have to, uh, that's, that's I think where it already went wrong. The panel, 
I had three people, two of them were security vendors, technology vendors. So when they were asked, so what are the, what's the biggest risk a CEO should care about? The first word that was uttered by one of those vendors was patch management. Now a CEO doesn't care, doesn't probably even know what patch management is. Um, so yes, we need to address patch management, don't get me wrong, but that's not the biggest risk that a CEO faces. The biggest risk is maybe that the company uh, um, has to shut down for a couple of days or that their clients uh, integrity get compromised or that their brand value goes down um, and that's the type of translation we need to make so sure we need to care about patch management but what does it mean if we don't address patch management why would the CEO care about that why would a board member care about that and are we measuring those things can we measure the impact of the days the things we str struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis on the business and on the business resilience, because we need to translate it into terms of business resilience. So if you look at money, spending, um, in our research we actually looked at, okay, what are the technologies, and we just listed a number of technologies that, that we see organizations investing in, where you get, so to speak, the biggest bang for your buck. What is the technology that really has the biggest impact, tangible impact, on reducing the cost of, of cybercrime? because you uh, 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 limit the risk or because it becomes easier to remediate things or you can quickly, more quickly identify things. And the interesting thing, and it is a little bit counterintuitive, maybe, um, is that the, the, the biggest impact on the cost of cybersecurity is still with good old-fashioned identity management, identity and access management. Now, that shouldn't come as a surprise. Because as security professionals, we all know that it all starts with identity, with access management. And particularly in today's world, where we are connecting everything to everything, and when identity management is not only about enterprise identi identity management, but also about consumer identity management and identity of things, having the basics of identity in order is going to be fundamental um, to, to mitigate cyber threats. Um, and the research backs that up. Any dollar you invest or any pound you invest in um, identity management, and also think about th things like privileged identity management, will actually have a big impact on the potential loss that you may uh, get when, when there is a cyber attack. Um, the next couple of things, and previous speaker spoke about it as well, security intelligence and threat sharing, that has a big impact because we live in a connected world. So do we know what's happening and can we, do we know what's happening to our competitors, our peers in the industry? And I wholeheartedly agree with what was said, what was said before, we should not compete on security. If one bank is hit, it has an impact on the entire financial services sector because people lose trust. Um, so we should care about what's happening in the industry and we shouldn't gloat when something happens to a competitor. Because why do you think you're better? Why do you think maybe you didn't just find out but you've been hacked uh, as well and, and you, may, you may be the next one. So we, yes, we should care and we should share threat. Automation, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, um, UBA, cyber analytics, uh, user, uh, behavior analytics, cyber analytics, innovative technologies. Now, you shouldn't invest in new technology just for the sake of it. Um, I've been going to the RSA conference in, 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 um, in the US for many, many years. And actually, after last year, I decided you know what we should do? We should forbid any CISO to go to, this, to the RSA conference. Not because the presentations aren't good. There's a lot of good content that we found. So maybe you can go to the presentations, but stay away from the, from the, from the expo floor. Because this year I, I've, I lost count. 200, 300 vendors all trying to sell you the latest new gadgets. So what I see when I come back, I see CISOs who said, yeah, I need that, and I need two of those, and I need a little bit of that. They take it back home. Some of it gets implemented, some of it ends up on the, sh on the shelf. 
without really thinking what is the problem we're solving. So I'm not saying you should just invest in technology for the sake of it. We should really think about what is the business problem we're solving. But we should invest in, in smart, innovative technology. Because um, the attackers are in, uh, using and uh, leveraging innovation. They are using AI. Uh, there are very well documented cases where we see the, uh, the attackers using AI to, to get smarter and to automate their work. They want to scale as well, so they automate it. So we need to do that as well. So investing in those technologies will really help us. Um, also, um, because we hear it all the time, there's a big shortage of people, and there is. And we need to address it, so I applaud any initiative of the Institute to, to invest in training and to, to train more people uh, and to get more diversity in our workforce. All of that is needed. But if, even if we succeed 100% with all the objectives we have there, we still will not ever have enough people to throw out the problem. And in fact, throwing more people at the problem is not going to solve it. Because reacting to, uh, to an incident, filtering, uh, making sense of all the information you get, that is something our human brain is not very good at. Um, we get overloaded quickly, we get distracted quickly, we feel like, yeah, I've seen that three times, I know what it is, I'm not interested in that. And we may ignore things that are very important. So we need to apply uh, artificial intelligence. We need to apply automation. Because, okay, we're getting better at detection, like I said, but we're not really getting better at remediation. Because we're too slow, we're too, there's too much bureaucracy, we need the support of IT if we want to get things done. So if we can automate that process, and rather than respond in a matter of weeks or days, can narrow that down to responding in a matter of minutes or even seconds if you've got autonomous uh, response, that will really make us more robust. So we need to invest in technology that will help us to make the right decisions, to focus on the right things and to automate our response um, and to augment um, the people skills that we, need, the, the, that we need there as well, the human skills. Um, now what you also see, and I guess that's not a big surprise, advanced perimeter controls are not giving you that much benefit. We all have perimeter controls. And I'm not saying do away with them, we need them. But they are going to get breached. So the question is, what do we do after that? So if you then look at what, what are organizations actually investing in, what are the, what's the technology they have, we see security intelligence is actually up there. Most organizations have some form of security, security intelligence and do some form of sharing. And sure, we all have identity management, we all have perimeter controls, but investing in those new technologies is still fairly low. And if we can, oh, I'll go back to you. You're just taking a picture and I was moving to the next slide. Um, if we combine those two elements, you get a very interesting um, uh, insight. Because you can actually see where is, where is the gap between um, where we are spending and where we are getting benefits. And actually on identity management, we're not doing that badly. Because everyone is investing in identity management. Everyone at the moment that I talk to is investing in privileged access management. And we should. Because um, gaining privilege is still one of the most popular ways of, of uh, penetrating your, your network. But then if you look at security intelligence and threat sharing, well, there's still a big uh, deficit. Um, there's still a lot to be gained by investing more in that area. Um, same for automation AI. Um, cyber analytics, UBA. And we are, you could argue that we are over-investing in perimeter controls, the more traditional things. So you could also say we are over-investing in prevention and not enough in detection and response. Um, always interesting, uh, GRC. So does this mean we shouldn't uh, um, invest in GRC? No, of course. A good GRC system to help us with compliance, to help us with risk management, I think is crucial. But what's the direct impact on your cost of cybersecurity? Well, arguably, that's, that's less than many of the technologies that you see uh, above that. So this insight can really help you by making investment decisions. It can help you to argue why should we invest in certain technologies rather than other technologies. Because 
even though security um, is an area where, where budgets are in most cases not shrinking, we still have limited budgets and we need to always be cost conscious uh, also in security and the decisions we take. Last point I want to make was on, on, on the metrics. If I look at how we report on security, it is still very um, traditional. It's still a lot on are we meeting certain compliance criteria. And I guess we all know that compliance is only a, a part of the picture. If you're compliant, it doesn't mean you're secure. Um, so we need to think about what are the relevant metrics that we can actually uh, report to our board. Um, because the business basically says, well, yeah, okay, so I see those compliance things, and apparently we're not compliant in all areas. But what does it mean? I don't really understand it. And you talk about technical, technical things like uh, um, strong authentication. You may talk about how much PKI we've implemented and things like that. Well, what does it mean for me? I don't really get it. Is that important? Is it not important? Should I worry about that? So we need to figure out ways to actually have more meaningful uh, metrics. If we can relate the metrics to what does it mean for our clients? What does it mean for the protection of our client data? Um, what does it mean for um, if you're uh, a, a, an airline? I had the discussion with, with uh, the CIO of an airline. He said, Flores, if I can relate a security problem to airline, uh, airplanes leaving one hour late, then I have a business case, because I know exactly what it's going to cost if the airplane leaves an hour too late. Um, so if I can make that correlation, my security will help with airlines, uh, airplanes leaving on time. Uh, and I think there's a business case to be made. So if you can relate it to business outcomes, you'll, you'll have their attention. Um, and you can actually show how you are helping to make the business more resilient. So, all the executives we spoke to basically agree that something's got to change. They don't know what has to change, but they say, you know, yes, my CISO tells me all these things, and I see the dashboards, and I see some red, and I see some green, but I still don't have that warm feeling in my belly that tomorrow will be safe. Because um, I don't understand it. I don't understand where my business is at risk. I don't understand um, um, uh, what I really need to do. Um, and then the CISOs are actually saying, well, I see more and more stuff coming at me. Um, so I need help as well. So again, it's that discussion that the CISO and the board need to have about, okay, where are the real risk? What's the, the, the part of the business I should be focusing on? I do see convergence. I do see more and more CISOs becoming responsible um, for IoT, manufacturing security and things like that, primary business processes, um, but they're not equipped for that. Um, so there's still a lot of work uh, to be done. So if I summarize, we need to be brilliant at the basic. Identity management is just one example. Of course we need to be good at patch management, vulnerability management, etc. So that's where we start. We start with a strong foundation. But that's not what we report on. We don't report on how well we are patched or, or how, how well we're doing vulnerability management. Um, we need to relate it in, to the business in business terms. Um, we need to pressure test. We really need to understand what is going to break if I really push hard. And that's also a good way to show to the business what can go wrong. And when I say pressure test, I don't mean penetration testing. Because, yeah, penetration testing, and again, we should do it, but it basically says, okay, yes, there's vulnerabilities on this server. Typically, we knew we had vulnerabilities in the environment. So what is the real added value of the penetration test? But if you really pressure test, you do advanced adversary simulation, um, like if you're a bank, um, you'll set up a fake company, you put some money in the bank, and you steal that money, um, then you can actually go to the board and say, look, it's possible. This is a scenario that criminals will use, and we've just proven that it's actually possible to do this. You'll have their attention. Um, and then again, it's, it's in terms they understand. Money got stolen. They don't care that it was through this vulnerability and that vulnerability and lateral movement, etc., etc. That's something we care about and we should care about. Um, but that kind of pressure testing, and also that's not a one-off. 
that's something we should continuously do and work with those red teams to actually increase our detection capability and our response capability. Um, and then thirdly, invest in breakthrough innovation. Not just any technology, but think about how can innovation help us to get ahead of um, um, uh, the adversaries. Um, and the quote we, we'd like to, to, to use for that is basically, let's outmaneuver, let's out-innovate uh, the bad guys. Um, and technology is on the one hand is a threat, but on the other hand, I think technology is really going to help us to, do, to, to indeed get ahead. So with that note, hopefully a slightly optimistic note, I think we have the technology and we can embrace the technology. And if we make that part of our strategy, we can actually outmaneuver uh, the adversaries. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thanks, Flies. So it's certainly interesting to hear there about prevention and prevention being so important for cybersecurity strategy. I think we hear all too often that prevention's dead and we must rely on isolation on detection and response. So a few of those points there around doing the basics, that's two talks out of two, we've heard that as kind of a primary requirement. So I'm now gonna pivot to the audience. So again, I'll, I'll be walking around and passing the mic. Do you have any questions initially, Floris? As long as they're not about football, then I'm happy. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Andrew Yeomans, and it's not about football. I've actually got a challenge to the accountancy professions, which is to provide some way of uh, gi uh, giving the board, and, and the CISO for that matter, the, uh, a measure of the value of data owned by a company. As I think that, that is actually the key to, one of the, uh, to, to the, the way forward that you're saying. Right now we have some, some figures in what the cost is of a breach if data gets stolen, but uh, it, in, in the balance sheet of a company, it, it doesn't... That, that, the value of data isn't reflected. There's a limited reflection in the share price of a company, but the board isn't, isn't judged in the same way, so they, they don't really care until things go wrong. No, I, I think it's an excellent point. I mean, I hasten to say I'm not an accountant, um, um, and, uh, but I do lecture at university where I train IT auditors who are, in many cases, part of accountancy <coughs> firms, uh, and that's exactly one of the points I make. I think their accountants' focus on financial statements is too narrow um, and they, anything that's outside the scope of the financial audit they basically ignore and they still give uh, a statement about going concern of a company etc so I think it should feature and I think it's an excellent idea and I leave it to the accountant to figure out how to, to, to put a value on a balance sheet. Yeah. Flo, it's just my kind of take on that I'll get your view on it. Is that, is that then a problem with because I think within the information security kind of discipline we have the concept of business impact assessments, we have data classification, we have things that we think we're doing a pretty good job of, in, in my humble opinion. That isn't getting sent up, is it? They, certainly things cascade down around information policy, but getting that information back, surely that would help us with some form of quantitative analysis here. Yeah, there's a couple of issues I have with business impact analysis. First of all, scope. Where do you start? What do you include? Um, Many of clients I see when they do business impact analysis, they start with what they call IT assets. So they start bottom up with applications and they start with the applications they know. Um, and then often there's a, it breaks in, in, in two places. It breaks where's the direct connect to the business and where's the real business value. So you only focus on the IT assets that you know and that may be in your data center or owned, driven by the, by the CIO. Um, and then secondly, they often fail to make the connect with the underlying infrastructure. And a lot of breaches, of course, happen on an infrastructure level. So how do you make that correlation with business impact? So yes, business impact analysis is very important, but we need to take it one step further. First of all, we need to start not bottom up at the IT asset level, we need to start at the business level. So really, and that's not something an external auditor would do, but it's certainly something an in internal auditor can do. Look at what are the business processes and where do we generate the most business value? And do we actually have an impact assessment on those business processes? You may well find that if you're an oil, oil company, your biggest value is in your exploration and not in your SAP system where you keep your financials. Um, and we, we often tend to miss those. I think so. So that traceability, really. I think certainly the architecture function helped with some of that. So any other questions? Best way of getting on We should have one of those ones they throw around. Thanks.
Thanks, uh, Nigel Jones from IAC. Um, I, I, it's very interesting the way that you, you advocate uh, communicating to the business. And when I look at uh, national level campaigns, there's a tendency to try and say, do the top 10 things or do the top three things. And it leads to the idea that patching, if, you, if there's only one thing you can do, then patch, you know, or migrate to Windows 10 and, you know, you'll solve most of your problems and you don't really need to think about anything else. And, and that's not what you're, you're saying in a sense. So um, there's maybe different, um, uh, different audiences and different reasons for communicating in this way. I think the, the national view looks at maybe a law of diminishing returns, which is that if you do these basic things, it covers 80% of your problems, and then everything else needs more investment, but it's only going to work on those 20%. Uh, is, is that uh, an issue that you incorporated into that sort of ranking system, you know, the diminishing returns aspect? That actually, a small amount of spend in some things give a lot more return than others. You know, how do you, how yeah. do you no, rate those no, two true, ideas? and I think the reason you see identity management so high up is exactly because of that reason. We've invested a lot um, in identity management. We've been talking about identity since about 20 years now, um, and we still haven't reaped all the benefits of identity management. So I think doing it right, and, and I see a new generation of identity management systems being implemented, privilege access management being one of them, is actually getting us across that hurdle so that the investment you make now are going to yield a very a quick return. Perimeter control, on the other hand, we've also invested a lot in that, and any additional money you invest in that is probably, to the law of diminishing returns, not going to give you any additional benefits, apart from the fact that we know the perimeter <coughs> is going to be breached. Now again, it doesn't mean you don't need perimeter controls, uh, but you need to balance uh, those investments. So yeah, that is part of the, uh, the research uh, from that point of view. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, yes, you have to prioritize. Um, so, and it does start with the basics. And yes, of course, patch management is important, but then the real question is, which systems are we patching? Um, are we patching all the, the, the relevant systems? Because patching 100% is probably never gonna happen. Um, and if you can't patch, are there different things you can do? Does that mean you then can have increased monitoring maybe around those vulnerabilities so that you can at least detect if there is a breach for that specific vulnerability? I think vendors, particularly vendors, I, I, I just say too easily, I just patch and your problem will be solved. Uh, it's not that we all know it's not easy and we know we're never going to reach 100% of, of uh, the right patch levels. Um, so again, yes, we need to patch, um, but that's not going to solve everything. I'll come over there just one second. I think one of the, the biggest challenges from my side, so I actually my day job work for a vendor, and my, my view on patching is one of the security controls that we have that we ostensibly as a CISO have within our purview, right? So patching is a security control. We're reducing vulnerabilities, we're removing them. But how many of your organizations is patching the responsibility of a business unit? So you'll have the CISO, the security function with vulnerability management, they identify, like you said there, Fluis, 200,000 vulnerabilities. Then you pass over that spreadsheet to a business unit who says, you know, okay. we're not doing yeah. it. So I think that's a big problem. It was over there, wasn't it? Can I pass that? Hello, uh, John Douglas. I work mainly in uh, uh, child safety. Um, I think, or I'm very worried about uh, what you've said, in the sense you seem to have got the problem backwards. Fundamentally, the problem I'm faced with is making absolutely sure that the right information gets to the person who can act on it without it going anywhere else. Um, and I think the conversation is always about not stopping information, not about delivering it. And I think as far as security is concerned, well, my view on security is getting the right information to the right person at the right time. Uh, all these other technologies, they're all about, well, how do we stop somebody getting it? I want to know how we can get to it. And that's part of security. No, I, I'm 100% in agreement that the, the role of security is not stopping people from doing business, is actually enabling them to do their business, but making sure the right people get to the right data. So. The, I think we 100% agree. The technologies I'm talking about here is about so how do you keep, and the per perimeter control uh, is about how do you keep the bad guys out. 
access management is actually about exactly your point. It's about how do we enable the right people uh, to get access to the data. And if you do that, then under those circumstances, you've got something you present to the board in any environment to say it's about enabling your people to do their business better. Oh, That's what we're selling. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. But it still means we need to invest in certain technologies. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you, you need basically all the things that I, that I spoke about. But no, I agree. Uh, <coughs> what we should be telling our business is, by all means, let's go digital. Um, and we will help you to go there safely. Uh, and that's why we need uh, money. We, can, we will make sure that the business becomes robust and, and you'll be enabled to implement whatever innovative technology you want. Yeah. Thank you. Floris, I was really interested in, I mean, I'm not surprised that the slide that you put up about return on investment effectively was on technologies, but have you got a view on investment in non-technologies, things like training, culture, awareness, stakeholder management, that sort of thing? What, where, where would you see that in the level of priority that CISO yeah. should be involved in and returns that you would get from that? So that wasn't part of the research. So the research is really looking at enabling technologies because we see this tendency of people to in invest in technology because they like the shiny lights or whatever. But no, uh, part of getting the business right, part of get putting security first, it has everything to do with culture. So it has everything to do with training, um, with changing people's behaviors, changing their mindset. So yes, that's definitely uh, a big part of where investment should go, 100%. Because um, we all know, even if you have fantastic identity management, if people give away their credentials, technology is not going to save you. Um, now, there may be certain technologies that make it harder to give away your credentials. Um, but yes, it starts with users understanding that it's not IT or security doing them, this to them, but that this is something they want because it's their data, it's their business. The reason for asking the question is sometimes I still see a perception that the CISO's role is to do the technology piece mm -hmm. and not enough around the culture and the yeah, awareness and right. the training piece. Agree, agree. Although I think that's rapidly changing. 